Okay, um, so we'll continue with um, serial play audiometry. So once the child is uh, probably around like two, two and a half, three, you can start to do this test. So um, you have to make it fun. You have to make it fun to keep the child engaged. So there's play. Um, most common type is put a block in a bucket. <coughs> the child, again, you have two audiologists, so the audiologist sitting in the room with the child um, is going to hold a block, a toy block to the child's ear. And whenever a tone comes in, the child is going to be taught to put the block in the bucket. And then the audiologist is going to get excited and say, yay, congratulations, good job, you heard the sound, okay? So um, you can do this either with headphones or in sound field. Um, if you do headphones, if you do insert earphones, you can do uh, one ear at a time. So that's obviously a better test if you can get both ears. So the problem with play audiometry is a child might get bored after a while, um, or they might be overly willing to please you and you might not be able to get the best test. So if you can see this picture over here and uh, watch the video, here's the audiologist in the booth with the child. She's wearing headphones, so she knows what's going on. She knows when a sound's coming in, or if it's in sound field, she can hear it too. Um, they're waiting for the sound. They're waiting for the sound. When the audiologist in the booth puts the sound in, they build their tower. Okay? So you try to make it like a little bit fun for the child to keep them engaged. You can also do speech testing, so speech recognition thresholds uh, with spondy words with spondy words that the child would understand. So you're not going to use the word like iceberg. You're going to use ice cream, uh, airplane, railroad, baseball, and you're going to search for their thresholds. Uh, again, children might have like a limited amount of time that they're willing to give you. So you have to move fast when you're testing a child and you have to try to keep things fun and keep the child engaged. We can also do um, <coughs> speech recognition scores with the WIPI. Remember the WIPI, the Word Intelligibility by Picture ID test, where the child points to the pictures. Or you could do an open set word list where the child, the PBK word list, so the phonetically balanced word list for kindergartners, so with words that are uh, more suited for a kindergartner. So we have speech recognition threshold with spondy words. You have speech recognition scores, which you can obtain through the WIPI by pointing to a picture or by using a phonetically balanced word list and having the child say the picture back to you. Open set tests are always harder than closed set tests. When you're done with your testing, you double check. Are your pure tone thresholds correct? Does everything seem to make sense and line up? the SRT correspond to the PTA. Um, we don't use masking. If you remember, masking distracts one ear while you test the other ear. Uh, it's a little confusing for children because they'll say they hear the sound, they hear the sound, you know, the sound of the masking noise that's just present. So it's, it's tough to do masking on kids. You're not going to do it on kids. The MCL and the UCL isn't really done on kids either unless you're fitting them for a hearing aid, in which case you want to know their UCLs and their MCLs. You perform them the same way you do with adults. So remember the MCL is the most comfortable listening level and the UCL is the most uncomfortable listening level. Uh, if you can't get any tests from a child, you can do your, if you can't get subjective tests for the child involved, you can do objective tests. Remember objective tests that children they don't have to do anything. They just sit with the probe in their ear. Quietly, though, you got to get them to sit quietly. If they're not going to, you know, if they're not going to sit quietly, you're not going to get any tests. Okay, so language disorders, uh, significant language delays, they are caused by hearing loss, congenital or early acquired disorders, ADHD, emotional disturbance, autism. Uh, a lot of those other things can be ruled out. That's why children go to the audiologist to rule out hearing loss as a cause of their language delay. Now, an infant might have auditory processing disorders in addition to uh, language and learning disabilities. 
and this stuff is um, very subjective. So um, my feeling is, you know, there's a lot for an infant, for a child that has um, language or learning disabilities, uh, there's a lot going on in the brain and it's all related. So I think a lot of auditory processing problems are related to ADHD or related to, you know, learning disabilities and language disabilities. It's all just, it's all something and it's all subjectively diagnosed. So sometimes it's the person that, you know, first diagnoses the child that gets to put that uh, label on the child when it's really, um, you know, it's a lot of things going on. So auditory processing disorder, these are children whose recognition and use of language is not age appropriate and it's inconsistent with their level of intelligence. So it's two to three percent of children. It's more likely to occur in boys. These children tend to have other learning disabilities. Like I said, it's like there's a lot going on in the brain. They might have poor listening skills, short attention spans, poor memories, and poor reading comprehension along with problems in reading and spelling. Uh, the hallmark of auditory processing disorder is that the child has trouble understanding speech in background noise. So children with auditory processing disorder are going to have completely normal hearing tests. Um, the, it's that they have trouble focusing and they especially have trouble focusing in background noise. So children, um, these, this auditory processing disorder might also contribute to delays in speech and language or poor performance in school, lower self-esteem, uh, inappropriate social contacts. They may prefer to play alone. Your intervention is aimed at improving listening skills and spoken language comprehension, improving the signal to noise ratio, using FM systems or auditory skills training, metacognitive training. The best thing you could really do is improve that signal to noise ratio. All children, all children benefit from an improved signal to noise ratio. There might be psychological disorders. Uh, hearing loss acquired early in life can have an effect on social, intellectual, and emotional development. Infants um, or children with hearing loss, they might um, get in more trouble at school. You know, a, a teacher, especially if an infant has a unilateral hearing loss or a mild or moderate hearing loss, the teacher might say, oh, they're just not paying attention you know, when really the child's having trouble hearing and it's, it's hard to focus if you don't hear well, right? So how hard is it to focus just on my lectures? And I'm assuming most of you have normal hearing. So if you had hearing loss, it'd be a lot harder to focus on my lectures. So these children might get, uh, you know, singled out or in trouble in school, or let's say they're, um, you know, trying to make friends and they get frustrated and because they don't hear so well, they have more limited language skills, and because they have limited language skills, they don't necessarily have the words to express themselves appropriately, and uh, they get into more trouble. So children with hearing loss, they're going to have psychologists on their IEPs to help them. There are developmental disabilities that may have cognitive impairments, and in, in these groups, hearing loss might go undetected because um, the behaviors of the auditory tension may be attributed to the child's more overt handicap. So the more obvious handicap might mask the hearing loss in children with developmental disabilities. An evaluation can be very challenging for the audiologist. So uh, just because we have newborn hearing screening doesn't mean that all infants are identified at birth. Um, many infants, many children, by the time they enter school, have developed a hearing loss. So it's, it's very prevalent. It's very prevalent. If you work in a school, I can guarantee that you are going to have children with hearing loss on your caseloads. So 
more than 5% of the school population has a hearing loss. Uh, you know, and it's supposed to be, you should, all hearings should be screened every year or at least every few years. And uh, unfortunately, I don't know, well, I do know New York City's justification behind it. It's a stupid justification, but uh, New York City doesn't even screen for hearing anymore. They justify it. They say that, um, you know, oh, hearing loss because of newborn hearing screening, we don't have to worry about identifying hearing loss in schools anymore, which is completely not true. Hearing screenings, you'll probably do some of these when you're in graduate school. You fix the intensity on the audiometer at 20 decibels, and you check 1, 2, and 3,000 hertz. So you, it's like you, you just got to move fast. Um, this isn't the best test, but it's better than nothing. And it's able to test a large number of children uh, in a short amount of time. Some screens use tympanometry, which is awesome. I did a screen on a school in Queens Village, and I used tympanometry, and it turns out that like 60% of the kids I tested had a middle ear pathology. So 60% like of the children I tested had uh, fluid in their ear or negative middle ear pressure that I wouldn't have known about had I not used tympanometry. Environment is important. So, you know, you would test in the quiet nurse's office. You're not going to test someone's hearing in the cafeteria, right? That would be, that would really mess up your, uh, your test validity and your reliability. Sometimes uh, a child might have a non-organic hearing loss. A non-organic hearing loss is, uh, you know, it's, it's when the child pretends to have a hearing loss. So the causes could range from a misunderstanding. So maybe the child didn't understand your directions um, or maybe they're doing it on purpose. It is easy to identify kids that are malingering the earlier you identify it, the earlier it can be managed, um, you know, the better off the child is. So, for example, let's say a child uh, is in school and his parents are going through a divorce. And he goes and he gets his hearing tested. And uh, he's not really paying attention. And he fails his hearing test. So, um the audiologist sends him back to the classroom and uh, she says, all right, you know, next week you have to come back, you know, in a few days you're going to come back and get your hearing test again. So the kid's like, huh, I can get out of school again. I get out of class again to get my hearing tested, you know, and then the child fails again. And um, then maybe they try another time. The kid gets to leave class again to get their hearing tested. And uh, eventually it turns into, you know, they have to go see an audiologist to get their hearing tested. And then when they're at the audiologist, you know, the mom is there and the dad is there and the child's getting a lot of attention. And then they, you know, they keep up this charade uh, because there are other things going on at home. So children that are, that have non-organic hearing loss, uh, they're very easy to identify because you could have a normal conversation with the child, but their thresholds would they would be pretending with thresholds that they had a profound hearing loss. You can't have a uh, normal conversation with a person that has profound hearing loss. Also, it's very, very hard to, it's impossible to consistently get, you know, um, abnormal thresholds. So it's important to talk to the parents about their behavior, refer to a a psychological consultation you're not going to say to the child I know you're lying I know you don't have a hearing loss and you absolutely do not want to say that you would say something more along the lines of like oh you know um, my computer so you know you do OEEs you said my computer says that you can hear okay uh, maybe you didn't understand my directions do you want to try again right so you give the, the child an out okay that's it thank you